please. Uh, yes. Hello. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you for your talk. That was great. I really liked the images that accompanied it. Uh, my question is, I noticed a shift from the beginning of your talk towards the end of your talk, uh, specifically when you were talking about isms and speaking about capitalism as a force that we can't imagine this, this force that exploits, that it has this anthropomorphized will. And then towards the end when you were, you kind of went back to it, talking about the system. The system is broken, you know. And it makes me think about what's happening on Wall Street, you know, going down there as someone who considers myself something of a theorist and thinking, what's my role here? What do I do? You know, do we continue to think about a greater logic of a greater system? Or, you know, I guess my question is, how do you see the role of theory in these local uprisings? You know, can we, I, mean, I think about Mahmoud Landa when he talks about, you know, there is no capitalism, there's just local markets. You know, how do we imagine the interconnectedness between Wall Street and Madrid and Egypt? Yeah, I guess it's kind of a disconnected series of thoughts, but maybe you can get something out of that. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think that the wrong role is for theory to come in and think they have a, a you know, a, a, the determining role to play. What, what I think one can really do that is helpful is to A, you know, point to it, not let it get invisible. Slava, you were down there. I saw you on YouTube. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and to say, yes, it matters, it's happening. And I think, I mean, I think it's a theoretical move to insist that it's about something global and that it's new. Because I've heard a lot of times people um, say things like, uh, this is American progressivism, in other words, make it American. Or they'll say, this is the, t this is the 1960s, this is the anti-authoritarianism. In other words, every time it's named, it's named as something that already was. And I think the best thing a theorist can do is keep it unnamed. Keep it unnamed. And I, I just thought uh, what uh, Badiou was talking about yesterday was very apropos. Uh, in, in the, I say he was talking about this a weird thing, but cy cyber spatially he was, I suppose. Uh, it, this idea that we, that keep, slow down time, don't, you know, don't uh, think that now we rush into the Winter Palace, but slow down time and actually expand it, expand the space so there can be more talk and more actions and more things that people never even thought about. Because if we're thinking about it, if we already know it, and we try to name it with that, we push it back down. So I think it's really, really important. I mean, Slava would say, you know, you keep on saying it's hopeless because if you do, that makes people actually dialectically do something about it. And there might be something in this, but I've also heard a lot of Marxists be very, very cynical about this because it, it's, it's too idealistic. It's just, you know, it doesn't have any real uh, analysis of class or anything like that. And I say so much the better, just keep it open, keep it going. And, you know, I mean, fantastic things happen. And they will happen differently. For instance, if you went down there and you were counting the numbers of people that were there, like Thursday afternoon I happened to be there, small number of people, right? If that had been a 1960s demonstration, it would have been a failure. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because how many people came at 7 o'clock in the morning to give support so that that would not be closed down in order to clean up the square, you know, the issue. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it, it, there is something else going on when uh, people are aware of something, even if they're not actually present. And they're aware of it in ways that make them do things differently themselves, wherever they are. I, I mean, I, I do think that it's not crazy to be... Um, I, I do think that the worst thing an intellectual could do would be to be it know-it-all, either I've seen it before, or I know what it means, or particularly it's, it doesn't rise to the level of philosophical sophistication, whatever. You know, I mean, I'm a little bit, this, is, this was a little bit of a jab at philosophical approaches in my talk, but you know, because I do think that this, but, but intellectuals can do that, and it does matter. That is, they can open up the space, they can point to it, they can affirm it, they can have faith in it, hope. No, just faith. No, worse. I don't know, but they can, they can affirm it. 
there a next one? Yeah. Please. Yeah, this is actually um, following in the line of the last question. Um, and I also found myself agreeing with a lot of your pr propositions sort of from start to finish. And I actually was going to, sorry, uh, characterize you as a pragmatist until you explicitly disavowed that. Um, no, so I, I said I was. Pragmatists in, pragmatists in the Deweyan sense, oh, sort of oh, the I institutional yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. So I guess this would be a sort of practical rather than a pragmatic question. Um, and it, I, I guess going back to the, the notion of, of sort of this gap between theory and practice or theory and what's actually going on, um, it, I mean, I've also been down to the square, and sometimes it is very chaotic in the sense that you don't even know what's going on. You f hear a lot of different discourses. There aren't a lot of demands. Um, and I noticed that in your presentation, you were showing a lot of snapshots. Um, so I was wondering if there's a way, you know, to mediate, if there's a role for the intellectual specifically to mediate between theory and these images. Um, because, of course, your example is not Marxism, but it is Marx. So my practical question is, who are you reading right now? Who, who are the people who are writing about, you know, about what's happening now? Who are the people who are connecting this to sort of long-term issues? I mean, is it Wallerstein? Is it, I mean, is this something that, that should not happen? Or, you know, or is there a way that one can mediate between those sort of things? And I'm thinking specifically not just of, of actual, like, practice being in the world, but also of analysis, you know, writing right. books, right. writing articles, what we as right. academics right. can do. Right. Right. So, yeah. yeah, well, I think that um, one should read outside one's area of competence, and I think one should definitely read about the rest of the world and what's going on there. I mean you know, pick what's interesting you at the moment, but don't leave any of it out as irrelevant because it's all relevant. And that could be China, it could be Russia, it could be uh, Africa, it could be India, it could be South America. But, you know, particularly if you feel, because one of the, one of the real um, regressions that happens when you're among the old left, let's say, in this country, is the knowledge of the rest of the world is n not very great. And that needs to be, uh, you know, we need to be reading in ways that make that less the case. But obviously, you know, and, and uh, uh, Wallerstein, I don't read him now exactly, but, you know, I am reading, I'll tell you what I'm reading. I'm reading about uh, Muslim merchant law in the 9th through the 13th century, because it's really quite interesting as a form of capitalism that wasn't this capitalism and was pretty good. And the only reason this capitalism got off the ground is it broke the law. The merchant law. Just literally one sentence. I will not, you have, uh, just I cannot resist answering. As a good Leninist, my answer to what I'm reading is what all revolutionaries read in such moments, Hegel's logic. Please. Go. Well, I, I'm actually teaching Hegel's logic at the moment. Are you so. reading it? Huh? No, just teaching. <laughs> it happens to me often. I usually with films. I write about films that I haven't seen. I haven't seen Avatar. I haven't seen Rossellini. Please. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, the newness of these, the occupations and, and the movement because it seems like, um, so being a participant myself of, down at Occupy Wall Street, I, I get a sense uh, and from the experience that there's something new going on. Um, and I struggle to articulate it actually to, to other people. And usually my answer is, well, you, you have to go. You have to because there's some sort of feeling that emanates from mm -hmm. what's happening there. Um, and, and, I, and I I listened in the talk for, for moments where maybe something would be said that could, could, could capture that newness. And it sounded like a lot of the sort of descriptive adjectives actually came from movements that have come before. So horizontalism with Argentina and before that autonomia in, in Italy. And um, I guess so. The question is some sort of connection between how do you articulate something right. that's new um, right. when the language right. you're giving is from the past. Well, here I like Zizek very much. Uh, you know, when he says that the, an event pro you, you have to produce the conditions of your own pos of some if something new happens. I don't know. You probably say it better than I say it saying it for you. But try <laughs> say it with your own words. As patronizing teachers say say it using with your own words. <laughs> 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 uh, 
uh, I think that, you know, that there, the conditions of possibility come after the fact, or you, you produce the conditions of, of the possibility. You, you produce your own conditions of possibility. Yeah. It's something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's pretty good for a student. So um, uh, that, that's, that's what I'm thinking. And of course, there are all kinds of precedents. Right? And what's beautiful is the fact that they aren't one narrative that's already been told. I mean, you certainly can talk about the success of the global women's movement. You can also talk about Argentina, and you can talk about Chile, and you can talk about, you have to. I mean, then you have to talk about the fact that in Chile right now, uh, the, the protest has become a so-called student protest, um, where, because before, before uh, you know, during Allende, there was almost free education, and now, of course, you have to pay because they've been privatized. They've gone through the Chicago School of Economics training, and uh, now there's no money for universities. I, also, I was going to say about Woodhull, the important thing to remember here, too, is the, 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 the still uh, gre gre egregious connection between sexual liberties for men and women's economic dependency and the fact that New York Times reported anyway that... Um, women who have student loans are selling their sexual favors to uh, the men of New York uh, in order to pay off the loans. Uh, it, it's, uh, I, th I think that one, the more, pre oh, here would be the thing. Rather than say, oh, this is just another case of anti-authoritarianism of the 60s or whatever, one would have to say, no, it's this and this and this and this and this, right? And the more, universal the precedents are, you know, the more communal or common or communist the action would be. So you may have just answered my question, but I wanted to say that I like the idea of uh, not naming it, but you can't deny that there are lots of people out there working hard to name it, and that eventually they may succeed and that that may be fatal. So are you sort of implying that the role of theorists is to play a defensive negative role of just resisting think, and undermining? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so. Uh, can I now come in the, with my, I'm sorry, first you. No, no, I'm sorry. There are two guys behind, please. Uh. Um, yeah, uh, there are two things uh, during your talk that um, struck a chord with me. And I was thinking about uh, when you talked about um, keeping, making sure that the Occupy Wall Street protests remained nonviolent. Um, and the worry that I have with that particular um, outlook is that it risks <coughs> marginalizing those who, you know, express their anger or rage with the system differently. And that instead of necessarily, like, um, incorporating these different expressions, that it you're going to marginalize them and kick them out, and it's going to form like a particular kind of like authoritarian movement within Occupy Wall Street. And that's like, I mean, I've heard that, and I think I can't remember now whether it was Occupy Chicago or, or DC. I mean, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but they actually handed out cards um, how to how to pick out an anarchist so you can kick them out. Um, and that seemed really really outrageous. Um, that this is this is the kind of attitude and technique that's being applied. Um, and I, I'm worried that this particular movement without any kind of, say, like, victories. Like, the first occupation itself was, you know, a, a violence against, you know, capital had to break a particular kind of laws, you know, allowed sleeping bags, they still bring sleeping bags to the, um, to the, uh, to the square. Um, without a kind of succession of, of victories that may require, like, you know, breaking of law, um, you know, going to the street or, or, or elsewise, um, it'll just become the space for just advocacy. That people will go there and this will be where I can get, uh, you know, a slice of pizza and, and you know, hope that, you know, Barack Obama or the mayor of uh, Wall Street will listen to me. I mean, forgive me, I'm Canadian, so I'm not sure exactly what the name of the act, but I mean, I just seen countless signs for like a restatement of a Glass-Steedman act or, or something. Right. right. And, and, and that just seems to be a, you know, right. a well, step Right. Okay. So I want to separate two things. Anarchists are great. Anarchists are wonderful. They should be all over the place. And uh, <laughs> we don't okay. kick them out. But uh, uh, anti-authoritarianism oh, anti yeah. as just a thing, you know, that reminds me of another joke. And it's, uh, you know, you're in a subway and some mother comes in with a little child and this child slaps you, slaps you, slaps you. 
she says, oh, he's being raised in an anti-authoritarian way. <laughs> and you slap him back and you say, I was too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a nice, uh, it's, an, it's a nice concept. I mean, you know, I'm- The form of non-violence that I like. <laughs> So uh, uh, we're, we're, we're really in a situation where, yeah, oh, go and, you know, you're the activist, great. I mean, when I'm in the role of the activist, I'll say what I want to do or, or whatever, of course. But there's nothing, but I'm saying as a theorist, and that was the way the question was posed, as a theorist, what can you do? And that, in my estimation, is not to name it. And I don't think that, you know, I mean, and the point is that, what, you've, what, what has opened up in this hole, this hole in knowledge, the knowledge is that these kinds of things can't happen. That's the knowledge, right? And the opening, the social action, I don't care what it was, whether it was you know, what, what people did to open it up. Mm -hmm. It's open. And look at everybody running in. You know, I keep on mentioning the New York Times. I don't have a TV in the place we live, and I get the New York Times in the morning. That's my major source, that and Amy Goodman. So those are, if it's not there, I may not have read it. So. Um, uh, the New York Times, uh, uh, you know, ran into that space. You had the uh, uh, op-ed, not the op-ed, but the regular editorial page in the, in the Week in Review and Sunday, big support of it. You have people supporting it from all over the place. And these people are saying, thank God, finally, finally, finally. We don't have to pretend that, you know, uh, the, the discourse of, of the crazy Republicans uh, deserves totally coherent airtime. So it's, it's, the, it's the way it just sucked up a kind of strength from all over the place that matters, it seems to me, as far as its powerfulness is concerned, its force. Oh, I totally understand the desire to not to ascribe too much history or theory or something like that to what's going on. But I do believe there are at least a couple things that can be said concretely about it, and I'd like to know where you think that could potentially go or what should be avoided as pitfalls, perhaps. Um, one thing that's pretty interesting is, you know, we're asking all these questions of what's happening. Well, we know who's doing it. This is self-declared 99%. This is broken on an economic distinctions. So I'd like to hear your comment on that but also what seems to be missing from it as opposed to other populist movements recently like the Tea Party or thing is the sort of lack of the appearance of the middle class. The middle class is not appearing so much. I mean, you have your occasional outliners, but it's not there. So I'd like to hear your comment on that. Well, I'll, I'll go back to Marx here because, you know, he, he, for him, the proletariat class was the universal class. It was the end of class because, in fact, it was and for him, any historically powerful uh, social action is an embodiment of the universal, is an embodiment of the universal. When you speak against uh, the present absurdity of the arrangement of things, you're speaking for the universal. You're not speaking for just a small group. It's not a self-interested group. It's not a lobby group. It's not a political party. It's just the whole thing is just getting absurd and more and more absurd. And you know, there we have these people like Obama trying to be reasonable in a totally irrational situation. And that's what Marcuse used to talk about as the rationality of the irrational whole. And that, it seems to me, is more important to keep emphasizing so that that 99% <coughs> could include anyone who wakes up to what's going on. Just observationally, do you think that part of the, I guess, rolling success of the various movements around the world um, is involved in this combination of the people almost delinguistifying the state apparatus at the same time that these narratives that are being given by the economic and state apparatuses are becoming so poorly structured and illogical that yeah. it's allowing yeah. the people to Right, and I, you know, I hope you all knew when I put Mubarak up on that split screen, that was brilliant editing by Al Jazeera, when you know, here is this guy is saying, oh, my children, I, am, I, I feel for you, and you're my good children, I'm gonna take care of you, and they're yelling, go, go, leave, leave, and he has, there's such a discrepancy in what the leader is perceiving and how he sees his own reality and what's actually going on in that square. And it's days before he goes down, everybody knew it was over at that moment. 
So, I'm, and I think that's that's what we're we're hoping for, right? That 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 there's some kind of uh, um, that, that you just can't keep the game up anymore. It's a game, you know, and there's there's nothing underneath it. You track you track a shift from an ideology of hope, you, and, and I think this is in reference to the Obama election campaign, to uh, spontaneous more spontaneous struggles globally. Um, perhaps, I mean, not to read into it, due to the failure of that, that mm -hmm. supposed mm -hmm. promise in its actualization. Um, you also phrase the question as what is what to do, right? From the, from the perspective of pragmatism, which of course harkens back to Lenin's question in 1902. And I wonder to what extent do you think that uh, spontaneous mass movements can, and this is the old vanguardist question, can, can survive or have political efficacy beyond the short term period without the need for some sort of theoretical intervention that would coordinate. Right, them. and that's why I say theoretically we make it long term. Right. And, oh, it's gone. Yeah. But all, the, all those showed a lot and everything, I mean, you know, the, these are all what to do, what, what is to be done. It's always the translation of the text. Yeah. And uh, I got those things and someone tell me if they're crazy because there may be people who speak all those languages in the audience, but uh, it's Google translation, what to do. Right? <laughs> so all of those are what to do in various languages from Tamil to whatever. So, uh, but not Belgian. No Flemish. No I asked Zizek if Slovenia was up there, and I saw it. You see, it, it, it was are even worse than yeah, I had it. I had it. <laughs> and before, the Canadian was for, you know, asking forgiveness for being Canadian. You know, what happens if we don't forgive you? <laughs> but we know who your Belgians are. You have two characteristics, pedophilia and good chocolates, and it's really one characteristic because you use good chocolates to get small children. <laughs> This is not racism, this is just uh, anthropological observation. <laughs> I'm sorry, are you? Do, can, can, can I'm you sorry. You mean long term? I, I just well, oh, I, that's right, uh, long term. Uh, well, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, okay, so I think every, I, I think there's a lot of the same spirit that got Obama elected, you're right. The disappointment must, is, I'm sure, just as great. So we, we said, okay, now we're going to elect a black president of the United States, and, it's, and he even was raised in Indonesia. He understands Islam. This is going to change the world. And he didn't change a thing because he said, we have to be pragmatic. We have to deal with the possible. But the possible is so impossible right. that uh, you know, it, it, it totally fails. So I think that what at least the, the sense that one has, uh, and again, this is like a blind man and an elephant, you never know what you're sensing, but uh, I think the sense is that this, uh, these are the people who are saying, you know, no, that, you missed it, you missed it, there was something more important, and, and you know, who knows, what, and he says, of course, he understands this dissatisfaction, but from his perspective, we have to help the banks and this and that. Well, you know, um, uh, people who have been, and the thing is, it has been going on first in Argentina and first in Indonesia. It's not as if uh, restructuring is something that happened first in Greece, right? It's been happening all over the world and people have suffered because of it. But the interesting thing is that there has been such a kind of democratization of the oligarchic class that you get wealthy Brazilians and wealthy Indians and wealthy Chinese for sure. You know, so there's wealth that's totally coherent but it simply isn't what's benefiting human majorities. Let's slowly, are you, have another, but be short. Yeah, very short. So maybe um, one way to reinscribe that <clears throat> that occurred to me is explicitly no demands, you know, this is all, we're all coming together, but then in the underground, you know, serious organization, serious theoretical work, I mean, that, that would be, I guess I'm wondering if, is that a part of it? The appearance of, and not to say like that there's some secret organization, but rather just actually doing the organizing work, not 
right. out in public in the media. Right. Okay, I think there's a new, uh, I, I get this from uh, Marina Citrin, who's part of our group. I'm gonna, uh, we have a globalization group. I'm gonna plug it now uh, at the CUNY Graduate Center. And she's been very active. And there is a role, an organizer role, but it's mainly in producing a structure for something to happen. You don't just sort of, you know, I mean, so you, it, it has to do with garbage pickup and things. You, know, you have to do that kind of structuring, right? But, uh, and you have to provide legal support and you have to do things like that. But actually in the sense of an underground, an underground, um, I would say, I would say uh, no. Uh, you know, a, a, an underground that would be the party that knows. Because as, as, as uh, Slavoj told us, there is no big other. There is no big other. And the Communist Party is not the big other. Or Communist Party or any, any group is not the big other. Can can I, can no, I, can I, I will I... not say anything so you are the, no, I will, I will answer you, you are too evil to be answered directly, I will answer you in my speech tomorrow morning. <laughs> so, no, I, so please. Can I um, uh, extend that a little bit, and it's also going back to the first question about the uh, rejection of isms and, um, but then you use the, you know, the system that we're in and so on, I think, I mean, I really uh, am in, in great sympathy with the project of a communist um, ethics or politics against the ontologization of the political. But I think there was one moment um, in this critique of the, of the isms that I think theoretically sort of, you know, giving up the battle too quickly and, and uh, arguing against the use of all isms. Because I think it forgets, you know, an insight that you know and, and Adorno and Benjamin certainly, in a sense, worked all their life on, uh, which is that capital, even if we don't call it capitalism, produces abstraction as an imminent feature. And that therefore, um, Slavo sometimes says as well, structures do walk in the street, right? What they were saying in the 60s. That to, to somehow have this nominalist rejection of uh, isms as these are abstract universals that are cosmological worldviews that doesn't exist, we should be pragmatic, stick to the earth and, and, and the ground, it forgets that Abstraction is not simply a speculative deviation. It is something that is, that is really actually being produced and that the, the one universal that is being produced and has been produced for the, the, you know, the past five or six centuries is, is the capitalist universal. Um, and then I think it, that nominalist argument against isms not only forgets that I think enormously important insight from the analysis of the logic of capital, which is based on abstraction, and therefore abstraction is not a, phil a philosopher's mistake. It's not the ontological turn that, that causes the, the creation of the political. This is part and parcel of the functioning of uh, the capitalist logic. But then on, on the other hand, I think this nominalist argument also ignores its own association with a certain political position. This is not a neutral position. Right? Um, and you call it sometimes, you know, uh, freedom or uh, all social action, the truth that it reveals is an expression of human freedom. And, you know, if we make this unpredictable, fleeting, and so on, it, it, it seems attractive. But it is also a political position that is opposed to what we can only call a certain assumption, you know, whether we call it ontological or anthropological, um, of the social nature of the human animal, which is exactly what Marx proposes in the 1844 manuscripts, which is sort of dismissed as being part of this ontologization. You know, I am social because I am alive as a human, or active as a human being. That action is first and foremost social, wait, wait. so that we are social wait, human wait, wait, beings. I, will, wait, will. I have and two, uh, yes. So those, those are the two issues. Okay. That I, I, uh, I think uh, a, a theoretical cop-out on the question of isms, that we shouldn't abandon this so quickly because it, it throws away the analysis of the production of the universal, which is capitalist. Okay. And you can oppose this only with another one. You said any social action is the embodiment of the universal. So we need universals, an alternative universal, in order to oppose the one that is existent, which is a product of you know, the political economy of capital. Okay, so I, I guess I wasn't clear on several things. One, one is, uh, I didn't say there's no, you couldn't have an ontology. Ontology is great. It's just not, there's nothing necessarily political that follows from an ontology. That was my point, okay? And that was a different point than the point about um, not nominalism, I mean, nominalism is precisely a word I would not use. And of course there's a capitalist system, but there isn't capitalism. And what I don't like about the ism is it seems to know beforehand what the meaning of something is. 
right? That's the only, that's the point. That's the point. Uh, it's not nominalism. We have to name. We have to work hermeneutically to describe. And you may describe by saying something's capitalist because it's actually, that's the right description. But if you start out by saying everything's capitalism and so therefore whatever happens, I know it's because of capitalism, then that to me um, is, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't not like it because it's universalism as opposed to nominalism, right? It's not that kind of thing. It's not nominalist versus universalist, not at all, but rather that it is, uh, uh, that it short, short circuits the necessity of actual political analyses and actual empirical, empirical work. What happened to the social sciences? What happened to, you know, Mark sat reading those stupid, horrible economics textbooks and everything. We seem to feel we don't have to do that. We just have to read Hegel and who else? Lacan and, you Otto, know. Otto Weininger, there are Ayn Rand. <laughs> no, no, no. There are many <laughs> no, 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 but I mean, you know, so I, we just don't, we don't have to care about descriptions of reality. And that I think is kind of a, a a deviation from Marx that I, that bothers my notion of Marxism. No, I, obviously that's not what I mean to say, but that I, I think that Marx had something going for him there. That, you know, we, it, it makes sense. Once he figured out the ontology, then he started reading economics. It wasn't vice versa. Okay, I propose, because I have some, just some 20 points, but I know my limitations just to, a moment of closure, which will also be a story, again, allow me a theological reference, you know. I like all this opening, but you know what Gilbert Keith Chesterton, I'm sorry, said. He said that our mind is like our mouth. When we eat, we open our mouth in order to close it on something firm. And the same should go for our mind. I think shamelessly that. Okay, okay, opening, but at the end, we need I'm going to the end even new dogmas. For new ethical order, I need, I want dogmas. Let me give you an example with which you would immediately agree. I wouldn't like to live in a society where you have to argue all the time, women shouldn't be raped and so on. I want this to be accepted as the unwritten dogma. So that if anyone even starts to argue for, ah, but maybe women enjoy rape and so on, you don't even, for me it's an ominous sign if you have even to argue against it. He should simply appear stupid, ridiculous, whatever, as I maybe often appear. You know what I mean? I think we should be absolutely shameless here. We should reassert a certain type of dogma. Yeah, but, but I don't want the state to do it and I don't want it to be politically inscribed. I mean, you know, in other words, I, 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 I I mean, if we're talking about an ethics here, we're not talking about us, you know, are, are you talking about what we need is a state law against rape? I mean, no, precisely okay. not. I okay. want this to be part of ordinary common knowledge dogma, so that you seem, and this is for me exactly, I hope we agree here, the mistake of a certain kind of political correctness, that it treats as something for which we should fight freely, I agree with you, as our let's say, everyday attitude as something which should be legally regulated. E but, yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> right, I guess, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I guess I, I agree with you. Of course I agree with but. you. But. But. to the but. <laughs> I mean, I know you are sharpening the knife be, be <laughs> your bed. Do it. I know. I, I, you want it. No, uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> I think... Um, that, uh, I mean, when I say an ethics here, I'm talking about an ethics of politics. And I, you know, I mean, I, I really don't think that, you know, the first thing we have to do down there on Occupy Wall Street is stand up there and say, first of all, there will be no rape after dark on Liberty Square or Zuccotti no, Square. No, legal thing. I yeah, agree right, with you. Right. I mean, you know, uh, the, the, the point is that the conditions of possibility of rape just aren't there, I would hope. Right? I mean, I don't get that too much. I don't really get the rape example too much. But uh, uh, I do understand what you're saying when you say that certain things should not always be open. But you're talking about open for a liberal democratic discussion, a kind of Habermasian, let's get, give reasons for or against rape. Yeah, yeah. You know, rape, uh, we could give reasons for or against it, right? And, and that we would have to do that every time before, before we immediately, you know, didn't do it, right? Oh no, obviously that's not the case, but we're talking here about trying to imagine a different kind of political reality. That's what we're trying to talk about. And if this moment 
historically, in a global context, is about another kind of political reality. I mean, it's so interesting to see. You notice I never mentioned Libya. Because Libya, NATO knew exactly what to do. You go in and you save the civilians, and so you kill many civilians, and then you arm the other side that kills the other civilians that you didn't kill, and you've gone in because you know the principle under which you go. No, that, that is precisely not the case that I talked about. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I hope the best for Libya. But, but that was the one we supposedly understood. But what's so interesting are these that are not, uh, not subsumable under the old ethics. And then there's a chance for a new ethics, a political ethics, to emerge. So, sorry, let us close, just I cannot restrain myself from adding. I doubt if NATO really knew it, because something which did strike me as a divine poetic justice is that now I read in the newspapers that the military commander of the rebels is a jihadist and Al-Qaeda guy. So that's where we are. NATO is finally arming Al-Qaeda. And probably they are there encountering old friends like, you know, that CIA old agent called Osama bin Laden and so on. So let's stop now. No, I really Really, I apologize for my, it's my nature, you know, <laughs> to be tasteless. But I really appreciate what you did. I will just try to engage in a dialogue in my talk. So let's stop now. See you at three, pinktlich, as they say in German, on the slot. Thanks very much for your patience.